artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, or AI, is in the news constantly because of the impact it is having on almost every part of our lives. Artificial intelligence is everywhere these days, but efforts to regulate it are really just beginning to pick up steam. Our EU lawmakers have just approved the world's first legal framework on artificial intelligence. The political agreement is expected to promote innovation in Europe while limiting the potential abuses of these advanced technologies. AI is certainly being used on a global scale. Hackers from China, Russia and other nations have been using artificial intelligence systems to help create their cyber attacks. But should we be using it in law enforcement? The calls to ban the use of controversial facial recognition software are growing louder tonight. We run the risk of the technology being used in discriminatory ways, perhaps only certain types of people based on their race or ethnicity are targeted. And will it replace human creativity? A lot of these writers are worried about being replaced by AI. AI can replace journalists in the journalism community. It can also replace script writers. Or affect our democratic institutions. Artificial intelligence, it could play a major role in the 2024 election. Some tech experts are warning that the technology could change the entire landscape of campaigning, blurring the lines between what's real and what's fake. AI is basically a turbocharger yeah. for, for everything that is a problem. Mm -hmm. Certainly for misinformation, AI makes it smarter and more dangerous. If Americans can broadly agree on nothing else, we should be able to agree that much of the bitterness and political tribalism that drives our public discussions is unhealthy for our country. In order to debate contentious public policy issues in a respectful and engaging manner without abandoning deeply held principles, the Cato Institute, in collaboration with the Brookings Institution, presents Sphere. address the challenges around AI. Artificial intelligence is affecting human civilization, a bit like the invention of the printing press or the internet did. It's a new tool that's having a radical impact on how we humans process, use and share information. It's a tool with capabilities that can create enormous value, but those capabilities also come with risk, and it's everywhere. AI is being put to use in our media, in commerce, in our classrooms, and even in law enforcement. How we balance the costs and benefits of AI is what we're here to discuss today. Joining me once again are Jennifer Huddleston, Technology Policy Research Fellow at the Cato Institute, Nicole Turner-Lee, Senior Fellow in Governance Studies and Director of the Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution, and Mark Meder, a partner at the law firm Crescent Meder and Visiting Fellow at Heritage Foundation's Tech Policy Center. We're thrilled to have the three of you back again. Thank you. Artificial intelligence is a huge topic because it affects so many aspects of our lives. Everything from autocorrect on my iPhone to using ChatGPT to help write an essay or Google Maps predicting which is the best route to take to work. We're going to cover a few of the issues at the heart of artificial intelligence policy today. Um, the three of you have areas of agreement, but also distinct perspectives. Mark, you're more of a conservative. Nicole, you're more progressive. And Jennifer, uh, you are more libertarian. I wanted to point that out because I don't think it's always intuitive what who takes what positions here. It's like AI has kind of thrown us all for a loop. Um, I, I want to start with the big picture globally around AI and how different parts of the world approach this topic. Broadly speaking, the European Union has taken a much more cautious approach to AI than the United States, with EU regulators waiting to make sure the technology, I guess, causes no harm uh, before the public has access to it. And thereby, they're kind of less concerned with, with, concern with how they might stifle innovation. The United States, on the other hand, has had more faith in the power of the market and businesses themselves to self-regulate. Uh, 
so it's to not stifle innovation. Jennifer, would you say that's a fair characterization? I would say that's a fair characterization when it comes to technology in general. Traditionally, what we've seen is that Europe has taken a much more precautionary approach, an idea that you first need to seek permission or prove that you've eliminated the potential harms or, or concerning consequences of a product before launching it into the marketplace. Kind of a ask permission if there is nothing that prevents it. Whereas in the US, we've traditionally had a much more light touch regulatory framework. The idea that when there's a general purpose technology, it's kind of innocent until proven guilty. If there isn't something preventing something from being done, if there isn't a clear evidence of harm, we let innovators and consumers try and find creative solutions in the market. And some of those products may succeed and become hugely successful. Some may fail. What's going on in AI is a bit interesting because while we've seen Europe kind of continue on this traditionally more precautionary, more heavily regulatory approach, we've also seen many in the US call for a similar approach. And you would think that we would have pause having seen the consequences of what that meant during the internet era for Europe. And instead of embracing what made the US so successful during the internet era, which was really that last general purpose technology, we have many instead looking at Europe, looking at other parts of the world, and calling for a much more precautionary approach to AI. Nicole, how would you characterize the approach of the EU versus the United States? Do you, do you agree with that? Well, I think Jennifer has actually uh, outlined some of the differentiators between the U.S. and the EU in particular, uh, given the um, first do no harm approach in the EU and the uh, break it down, we'll fix it later <laughs> approach here in the U.S. Um, I think for decades, we've seen this model work quite well when it comes to various aspects of technology. But as we go into this AI space, I think there are actually some lessons that we can take from the EU when it comes to higher risk um, algorithmic models or autonomous decisions. What do I mean by that? The EU has been very careful to sort of calibrate what does a decision look like in a financial service context, in a criminal justice context, in a context where it has the ability to foreclose on opportunities, economic or social, or even political for their uh, citizens. Here in the US, and you know, granted, these are American-based companies, so we're trusting that they have the same type of stewardship. Um, we're seeing similar problems, and here, we're sort of not looking at maybe the higher risk algorithms uh, compared to the lower risk algorithms. And this amalgamation of all of these issues into one bucket has made it harder, and I think to Jennifer's point, to regulate some of these uh, technologies that are being driven by AI and to figure out where do you draw the line in the sand over technologies that may actually cause more harm, that if you do break it, you can't fix it because it does actually generate some irretractable harms that are just harder for individuals to navigate. So I think, you know, for us in the US, we should all be taking note of what they're doing, right? It doesn't necessarily mean we need to adopt very prescriptive regulation, but I do think that they're they're really engendering some like uh, lessons that we should be paying attention to to help us get better in how we approach AI regulation. And Mark, do you think the European approach uh, to regulation is addressing the most important issues around AI? Do you do you like the the path they're taking with it? Sure. So I don't know if I'd go to a wholesale endorsement, but when I think about a new technology, I, I think of two questions. The, the first is, what does it mean to be human? And does or how does this technology help us to do that well? Uh, and so if you take that approach, I think it, it causes me at least to have some hesitancy to embrace this sort of permissionless innovation approach, uh, which really reminds me of, of Jurassic Park. Uh, I think Jeff Goldblum's character says, you know, they were so... Uh, obsessed with whether they could, they didn't think about whether they should. Mm. Um, mm. And we know how that turned out. And not to be you know, fear-mongering over AI, but I do think Nicole makes a good point about you know, this technology is different than other technologies. The scale, the power, and its effects on our society and way of life are so much more massive than you know, going from bicycles to automobiles. Uh, and so I think that does warrant taking some time to think through how is this going to play out to make sure we understand the technology and what its effects are going to be. Um, I think the content creation uh, industry, or there's lots of content creation industries, but for content creators in particular, you know, how is this going to affect their ability to compete? Um, 
if you think about AIs, the way it works, you know, it's not, it's derivative. It's not original thinking. It's not critical thinking. It's not coming up with things. Uh, it's, uh, it's an algorithm that's been trained on inputs. Uh, and the original content that human beings create is that input. And if you have algorithms and AI replicating that in sort of a, you know, a less good way and beginning to compete with those original content creators, you have a potential that content creators are going to be driven out of the market. They won't be able to compete. So now we have less original content, fewer content creators, which one means fewer choices and lower quality for consumers, but also means that then the AI going forward has less to train itself on and we risk getting into a feedback loop. So that's just one example that I think about, about how could this play out and you know, what can we do to think about that before we jump in head first. That's interesting because that, that it's that derivative nature of AI, the fact that it, it doesn't create anything, it just it is, it derives its power from the inputs that are created right. by others. Um, that was a big issue in the writer's strike um, last year. And Marco, I do want to come back to that because I, I, know, um, I know you've represented clients in this space. Uh, but Jennifer, do you think those concerns might be overblown? I think we need to take a step back and think about how other technologies in the past have dealt with similar problems. There may be cases where there is a need for clarification around issues of intellectual property, for example, or there may be cases where we actually see an art form evolve. And in many ways, I think that the conversations around how AI may play out in Hollywood actually has a really good way of looking at this. If you think about something like an idea of, well, we should just ban AI from movies, well, that could take away a lot of technology that we already use. That could take away a lot of editing software that actually can help reduce some of the cost and make it easier for independent filmmakers. That could take away some of the really cool special effects that we've come to, to expect. While there are some concerns about what this may mean for certain creative arts, and we, we may be having some very serious conversations around that, I also think we need to think about how this may evolve in art form. So think about when we went from painting to photographs. We still have both those art forms, but we consider them slightly different, even though one of them uses a technology and one of them uses more of a, a hand-drawn resource. There are going to end up being some really cool things that can be done artistically by people who really understand how to prompt AI really well. That may become an art form in its own right. And I think we have to be careful not to assume that the use of a technology in art is going to automatically eliminate the, the need for human creativity or negatively impact a particular industry or art form. It, it's likely that it may evolve and that there will be important, particularly societal conversations to have around what that means for that particular art. Mark, are you buying that? Could AI itself become a, a form of creativity or a, 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 an expression of creativity? Uh, personally, I'm very skeptical, but that may be my aesthetic preference. Um, <laughs> but I do think you know it gets to uh, an important distinction that I th we might all agree on, which is you know there's a difference between using AI to assist humans versus using AI to replace humans. Uh, I think that there's a lot of potential to use it to assist us, to help us do certain tasks better. Uh, where I get worried is when we move into the realm of replacing human activity and human create creativity uh, with algorithms. Uh, Nicole, you've just written a book that's <laughs> coming out coming out soon. August sixth. Uh, August sixth. August sixth. <laughs> this August book 6th. is coming out. Do you worry, as a content creator yourself, that AI will make your work obsolete? Oh, of course. I mean, I think. Um, when I think about this conversation around AI generated content and these conversations we're having right now on uh, intellectual property and copyright, I think those are huge concerns because we have never seen a type of technology that was able to generate uh, advanced capabilities in such a way where it could extract text, voice, and image. So what does that mean? For people like myself who are writing a book, uh, we want people to find us on the internet, but we want to be attributed for our work. And I think that's a clear distinction between, and I, I, I appreciate what Jennifer's talking about, right? 
there is this efficiency quotient <laughs> that we have to actually explore when we think about using AI for these tools, for movie production, uh, music production, how we work in law firms, et cetera. But then there's this part of this of who owns the right to your information? Um, how is that derivative actually protected? What does an AI-generated product look like? Who owns that, right? And those are questions that I think we still really need to talk about, and particularly for diverse and independent creators who do not have lawyers to sort of say, hey, my stuff has been scrambled into this AI product or can defend whether or not it was uh, beyond the fair use index. For me, those are really important concerns that we need to have conversations around. And I don't think we're quite there yet, right? We're still sort of scratching the surface, don't you think, on certain AI technologies mm -hmm. that have just blown our mind and our wildest imagination. It's really important for us to take into consideration existing settled policies, uh, ways in which the technology interacts with uh, those settled uh, policies, how humans interact with those technologies, et cetera, before we really land on one side. So I want to pivot a little bit to um, the use of AI in law enforcement. Yeah. It has been controversial, to yes, say the least. Uh, facial recognition technology is used to identify suspects but it has also misidentified innocent people. And it has been especially problematic uh, in identifying or misidentifying, as it were, people of colour. Nicole, I know you've written and testified on that topic as well. Yeah, this is, a, <laughs> this is one of those areas which um, it should make sense to people that we've not quite developed the right product in facial detection and analysis. And what do I mean by that? Uh, first and foremost, we still have a long way to go when it comes to addressing darker skin hues and being able to um, un, you know, uh, ravel what it looks like, you know, to be different in a facial recognition, facial recognition technology that has essentially been designed by people who don't look like me. What that means is we have higher rates of misidentification. Um, NIST, who is responsible for standardized neck technology, has essentially suggested that the technology does not work well when it comes to facial identification of people of color uh, in particular. And it does some uh, mismatching when you start to look at black men and black women just simply because we do things like change our hair. So if you were watching this last <laughs> version, my hair was straight. Today it's braided. It doesn't work well with facial recognition technology when we actually change up certain attributes. Or if you wear glasses, you're not always identified. With that being ca the case, we're seeing this technology used by law enforcement. Law enforcement are making decisions on who to sustain, uh, you know, higher bail rates or who to pick up and arrest. In Detroit, and I just testified before the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, a young woman who was pregnant was arrested in front of her children. She was suspected to be someone from a 2015 outdated photo that had just done a robbery. She sat in the uh, uh, police department so long that she had contractions and went into distress. She, her baby survived, but her children's harm probably will not. And so for me, these are one of those technologies, as we've spoken about the EU, that are what I consider to be higher risk. We really have to have more conversations on its technical cadence, uh, the ability of law enforcement to actually know what they're doing when they're using this technology, the extent to which we as a country have really certified it and trained people on how to use it, and really whether or not it should be used for investigative purposes or for prosecution. And until we actually have those conversations, I think it's a technology that we have to just really, really tread carefully on. Mark, as a lawyer, do you uh, what do you think about its use of uh, the use of AI in in law enforcement? Sure, I'm I'm also very concerned about the ability or potential for AI to infringe on civil liberties, uh, especially Fifth Amendment rights. Um, I think when the average person thinks about AI, there's sort of this ghost in the machine idea. We have we think of it just as black box. You press a button and it spits out the answer. And so I think more transparency about how this technology works and what its limitations are, what it can and what it cannot do is critically important, especially, as Nicole said, for those using it in the field to make sure that they're not over-relying on it, that we're not removing human judgment from the equation, because ultimately that's the only real backstop we have to make sure that these sorts of abuses don't happen. So again, it's like in the realm of creativity, it's a tool to help humans, yeah, right. not to replace that human judgment, I think right. is what you're saying. Uh, Finally, we're, we're going into an election season, and I, I found this in the Wall Street Journal last week, quote, open AI made video clips good enough to freak us out. <laughs> um, 
if you can fake what candidates are doing and, and saying, how are we supposed to know the truth anymore? So Jennifer, do you have confidence that the market is going to handle this problem as well? I think I actually do. And I would like to point out when it comes to the concerns about AI and elections, many of these are fears we've long had in general. And this is actually something I think is really important in the AI debate. Is it actually about AI as a technology, or is this just the next evolution of the concerns we've had about social media and elections, or the internet and election, or photography and elections? And what we're actually going to see is that education, not regulation, is often the better tool. And I point this out of there are a lot of ideas out there about what should be done, particularly in this upcoming election cycle to help people know that AI is now out there, to help them engage in better media literacy of when you see a clip that looks a little funny about a candidate, what are you going to do? Are you going to assume it's true or are you going to look for sources? Are you going to see who that source is and consider the potential biases of those sources? All the things that we see taught in schools already or hopefully taught that help people to make better decisions for themselves. When we're talking about elections, inevitably the question of speech is going to come up as well. So there may be things like parody videos of political candidates that if we say just you can't replicate a candidate for office or you can't replicate their voice could get taken down that normally would be allowed under a fair use doctrine and have been a lot of fun for a lot of people, to be honest. But what we are seeing is that there is already a market response. We're seeing not only news articles like the ones you pointed out try and bring awareness to people about what's going on, we're also seeing different platforms take different steps, particularly when it comes to election-related content, of what if any watermarking or transparency is necessary. Allowing that to evolve in the market instead of having a one-size-fits-all approach, I think is going to be really important because, again, when we're talking about AI, we're not talking just about someone going into chat GPT and saying, create a fake headline, create a fake news article, create a fake video of this candidate, we can also be talking about a lot of typically useful editing tools, something that perhaps is generating auto captions to make an ad more accessible to a certain community that might not be able to otherwise interact with election content. And I don't think that's what anyone wants to get kind of caught in the overabundance of caution. Mark, what do you think? Is, is the use of artificial intelligence just a continuation of, of the use of technology, or is this something new under the sun? Uh, yes, uh, right. both of them. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, I think at, at first it's important to set aside some of the easy use cases, right? When, when we t talk about concerns over AI, um, I don't think anyone's particularly concerned about, you know, editing our photographs uh, to, like, fix the brightness or tune them up, right? Uh, we're talking but they about were in, in uh, the case of the princess. Well, sure. <laughs> that might have been a little I bit just more. Just had than to that. tell you on that when they um, were. <laughs> but obviously, we're we're worried about things that are uh, inherently deceptive, right. um, and I'm worried that without some guardrails in place, we risk a sort of epistemological crisis in our society, where everyone just doubts everything because there's no way to know what's true, what's faked, and what's not. Um, and I think that's bad for democracy, where our government, uh, form of government, really hinges on the people making informed decisions about how we're going to be ruled. Uh, and you can't make informed decisions if you don't know what's true. Um, so I, I think it makes sense to, to have the market play a role in figuring out what we can do to address those concerns. But I think we need to make sure that those fixes are in place before we go too far down the road, because there's a potential for a lot of damage along the way while we're trying to figure out what works. Dr. Turner Lee, you get the final word. I know. You know, <laughs> just as always, there's a little bit of, of each uh, of my colleagues' um, insight that I obviously agree with. You know, I think in the end of the day, we do have some rules on what is the appropriate use of media in elections. And for some reason, we've sort of exempted AI from those rules. And I think we need to go back and revisit many of the conversations that we had in the last election about this, because they still are pretty much unsettled. What's actually even more creepy today are these deep fakes that actually do show up and misinformation that extends itself with a velocity and speed that it's really hard for people to disentangle what they're reading about a candidate. What that means is, I mean, having um, effective strategies and regulations allows us to have a more informed electorate 
and an electorate that is not, you know, necessarily um, taken advantage of for their vulnerabilities, particularly by foreign operatives. With that, I do agree. We need something that's more of a national education campaign, but that campaign may come too late as we approach our presidential election. I do agree that we need some type of system that will allow people to sort of disentangle what's real and what's fake, particularly in AI. We have talked about digital watermarking systems that people can see the origins of where that particular image is coming from. But more importantly, this is where I think we need some regulation, right? And I think we need regulation that is going to help us to just at least balance um, this wild west in the marketplace. I mean, I think Jennifer's right. This is not a new issue, but it's also one that has just some um, really bad outcomes for certain communities that tend to not only be behind the eight ball when it comes to digital the uh, AI revolution, but also the digital divide. And so I would just suggest, like, going forward, you know, let's talk about real policies that allow us to put in place some guardrails for what we expect from uh, political uh, information. Let's actually go back to Mark's point and get some folks who can tell the truth. You know, let's go back to investing in local media, uh, which, you know, represent the interests of the local people who live all across this country. To me, unless we come up with some counter to this, it's just going to get worse. We're in for a bumpy ride going into the election. The purpose of Sphere is to debate and consider deeply contentious issues in a respectful forum. Jennifer, Nicole, Mark, thank you so much for doing that here with me today. Thank you. For more information, please visit projectsphere.org. Thanks so much for watching.